Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 101 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author and PR consultant and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content events and training platform providing success strategies for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Now, before we get into the main part of the show, I wanted to let you know about my online PR course and group coaching program, Vegans in the Limelight. It's ideal for small business owners, including authors, artists and creatives on a budget who understand the value of getting yourself or your vegan brand featured regularly in the media, but can't afford to spend thousands of dollars or pounds a month to hire a publicist or PR firm. With Vegans in the Limelight, you get access to online video training that takes you through every step of how to get media coverage that can help you generate more leads and sales, as well as grow your email list and social media following. So we cover how PR and social media work in tandem, how to research and target the media without spending a cent, how to find the stories in your vegan brand on a regular basis, How to approach journalists the right way with ideas and stories. That's a really important one. How and when to write a media release. How to create an online media room for your website without spending heaps of time or money. How to respond to journalists' call-outs or queries, which is the easiest and quickest way to get media coverage and free publicity content marketing and PR, so how to create your own shareworthy stuff and leverage it to the max, writing and content creation tips for opinion pieces, listicles, features and columns, speaking gigs and PR, so how to leverage events to gain media coverage, and interview tips for print, online, radio and TV. Now, as well as the video training, which you go through at your own pace over 12 months, the program also includes a full 12 months of group coaching, including a monthly live Q&A call. You can also post your questions throughout the year on the learning platform, and you can post your pitches and media releases and get feedback from me before you send them to journalists. So you've basically got me holding your hand, helping you to do your own PR for a full year. It's a great value program. It's way more affordable than similar courses. And it's the only one that's specifically aimed at vegan and plant-based business owners, entrepreneurs, authors, coaches, and creators. Current students have already got media coverage in mainstream and specialist newspapers, magazines, radio and TV shows, as well as blogs and podcasts. So if you'd like to get your vegan brand or yourself featured in the media, but don't have the budget to hire a publicist or PR agency, then I highly recommend you check out this program. You get full and immediate access to the materials as soon as you enroll. You can find out all the details by going to veganbusinessmedia.com and clicking on the link for the program Vegans in the Limelight. And there's also a link on the show notes page. And if you have any questions about the program, including whether it's right for you, feel free to email me at katrina at veganbusinessmedia.com. Now for the main part of the show. In this episode, I interview Dr. Joel Kahn, holistic cardiologist and owner of two vegan restaurants, Green Space Cafe and Green Space and Go in Detroit, Michigan. Joel is the founder of the Kahn Center for Cardiac Longevity and professor of medicine at Wayne State University. Even though he'd practiced traditional cardiology since 1983, it was only after his own commitment to a plant-based diet that he began to explore non-traditional diagnostic tools, prevention tactics, and nutrition-based recovery protocols, and focus on holistic cardiology. Having treated thousands of acute heart attacks during his career, Joel wants to prevent these happening in future. He aims to achieve this by educating people about plant-based nutrition through his books, so far he's authored five, as well as a hundred scientific papers and hundreds of health articles, 
and speaking, as well as his restaurant ventures. He opened Green Space Cafe, a 120-seat all-vegan restaurant with a full bar, in Ferndale in December 2015 with his son Daniel and wife Karen. And just recently, that's March 2018 if you're listening in the future, he opened the fast casual eatery Green Space and Go in Royal Oak. In this interview, Joel discusses why he moved into the restaurant business, how he had to shift his plan for a small juice bar to create a much larger restaurant after the landlord threatened to open a butcher store next door, the benefits that came out of the budget for renovations doubling, why he decided to open a second fast casual eatery, how he chose the locations for both restaurants, how he manages his diverse businesses, including still running an active cardiology practice, the social media platforms that are the most successful in promoting the restaurants, and much more. Here's the interview with Dr. Joel Kahn from Green Space Cafe and Green Space and Go. Hello, Joel. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. We're thousands and thousands of miles apart, but we share a lot of common interests. We certainly do. And it sounds as though you're, you're just next door as well. We've got uh, really good sound quality, which is great. Loving technology that is able to connect us wherever we are. So, Joel, the first question I ask everybody on the show is their why. So their reasons for running their vegan business. Now, I'm particularly curious with you because you're a medical doctor, a heart uh, specialist, but yet you actually also, um, so you've got this whole separate amazing career as a writer, speaker, etc. Um, you've got your longevity center, and yet you also so own not one but now two vegan restaurants in Detroit. So tell me your reasons why. Why do you do what you do and particularly talk about why you decided to move into the restaurant business? Sure and um, I would advise anybody listening to have written goals and one month, one year, five year business plans and really know where you're heading but I didn't do any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I love your but honesty. But the rest of you should do it. So don't, <laughs> don't mess up. Um, but um, I've been really interested in health, nutrition, lifestyle with a very busy, very large cardiology practice over almost three decades. Um, have eaten plant based myself along with my wife for about 40 years and gave my three children options, but two of the three gravitated to plant diets. and. The third uh, is the one we dropped on his head when he was a little baby. That's a stroke, <laughs> but he eats very clean, but more paleo style, but lots of, lots of wonderful stuff. And anyway, you know, we, I was always, always talking with patients, you know, uh, diet, nutrition, disease, reversal, food is medicine. And similarly, although my wife and I have kind of cut back on travel a bit in the last three, four years, when you own a restaurant, that's part of the consequence. We traveled the world with the kids. We were just so used to seeking out healthy options, plant options in the Galapagos, in Europe, uh, in Asia, wherever we were. Um, that you know, life revolves around food when you've been a vegan for forty years. Life revolves around food when you've been a cardiologist interested in prevention for thirty years. <laughs> And, uh, you know, lived my whole life basically in Detroit. We knew the market. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, about four years ago, my oldest son, Daniel, and I started talking. He had an MBA. He was doing accounting. He was getting a little claustrophobic, sitting in a cubicle, crunching numbers. And it was just about a little juice bar, a little 400 square foot juice bar. I'd been to New York and seen so many examples, and there weren't many in Detroit. <clears throat> And we started looking at real estate and really things snowballed. Then we started making an offer, an existing restaurant that was small, but substantial and had a long tradition in the city. And then really, it was actually interesting because, you know, you do all this goal setting and business plans. And we had spent six months trying to acquire or at least, yeah, acquire um, a existing uh, plant based restaurant with a great reputation, but really a need for an upgrade. And on a Sunday, we concluded six months, we're done. We just can't come to terms. It's not ugly, but we're going to walk away. You can't keep negotiating for your whole life for one single spot. 
And on a Monday, the following day, a real estate agent, just out of the blue, commercial real estate agent that we vaguely knew, uh, said, you know, I hear you just signed a lease on your first restaurant, which wasn't true, but apparently the <laughs> word was out. I have the perfect second spot for you. And I know it's a little early, but I absolutely want to. And turns out that second spot was a small restaurant about five miles from the first. It was on the market. We leased it. Um, we realized it was, you know, a big jump from a 400 square foot juice bar to maybe a 1500 square foot, 40 seat restaurant. And really the first thing you have to do, my son had restaurant experience. I'm a bit of a foodie, but neither of us are trained chefs. You got to get good people around you, no matter what business you're in. Um, and uh, people knew me. I'd been in the plant community as speaking and writing and TV. And we really kind of, I always go to a movie. Many people may recognize Ocean's Eleven. You know, we got to get the team together, uh, call the <laughs> team back to do another job. And, you know, people came out of the woodwork that had plant experience and passion and some restaurant experience and very quickly had like a core team to talk about curating a menu, restaurant design, kitchen design. Um, you know, we had a budget. Um, it was a little more liberal. Uh, then, you know, somebody absolutely scrapping together the last dollar. Uh, uh, it's not, you know, I'm no Rockefeller, but I had a couple, you know, uh, coins to put into this. Right, and so then the, yeah. the last little piece of the story is this was going to be, so actually just a couple more, because everybody in the business world should know how things unfold. We were going to modify the restaurant. We were going to, you know, do serious upgrades to it, the existing restaurant. But within about two weeks, the general contractor, who had done a lot of restaurants, told me, this is an old, dirty restaurant. There is mold. There are actually animal bodies. There is all oh, kinds of stuff. Yeah. Because we need to gut it and do this clean. <clears throat> and I said, that's great. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a doctor. Guts are good. I like that. <laughs> what, I, what I didn't realize is that just blew the budget up by about two times, three times. To literally take everything down to the, you know, to the fundamentals, the foundations and rebuild. Now, despite the budget going up, it turned out when we really ripped all the drywall, all the ceilings, the flooring out through the kitchen and donated what we could, we found out there were some absolutely unknown 70-year-old brick walls. There were marble floors. There was an amazingly high oh, ceiling. There was a lot wow. of stuff that we knew about, and that is the look of our existing restaurant is more warehousey than we ever anticipated because it had that feel. And the last piece of the story is um, next to our business was a clothing store. And uh, I won't go into too much detail, but an older owner in the middle of our construction passed away. And the landlord uh, who happened to own both buildings, our space and that space said, you know, basically I'm going to put a meat butcher shop next <gasps> to your restaurant. Oh, no. If you don't consider bidding on this space and taking it over and <sighs> after really serious consideration, because that took us from 400 square foot juice fire to 1500 square foot restaurant to a 4,000 square foot restaurant. Oh. We took it over. We broke holes in the walls. We broke holes in the basement. We designed patios in front and back. We went from, you know, a little juice bar to 40 seats to about 120 seats in the, uh, we don't know if there's ever summer anymore in the United States. We're having a very wicked spring. But anyways, so here we are. And it turned out we opened uh, December 1, 2015, I think it was. And ever since that day, if we had been a 40-seat restaurant, there would be lines for four blocks. We were, you know, we served sometimes hundreds and hundreds of people a night. And, um, you know, we're not exactly killing it, but we're busy. And... Uh, it's turned out to be good to go big, go high end, and go beautiful. And uh, people never expect that from a plant restaurant. Right. Wow. I'm really glad you shared that journey because I didn't know the kind of the, the detail that you'd mentioned there. It was almost like the universe kind of stepped in there and said, no, you're not just going to open this small juice bar. This is what you're meant to do. And I mean, obviously not everybody would necessarily have been able to do that. Like you, you talked about, you had a certain amount of funding. You were able to say, okay, yes, we'll, we'll succumb to the blackmail of the landlord essentially and take over this, um, you know, this next space. So um, I guess that's been, been kind of interesting. So in terms of you mentioned you've sort of self-funded to date I mean is that something you've continued to do as opposed to say seeking outside investment yeah so far this restaurant has been funded by my son and I 
and really a robust sales, um, profitable mm. sales. Um, and we just opened, and I know we'll talk about it, a second version of a green space cafe called Green Space and Go. And it's a, a little smaller footprint that I think will be very successful, more in the fast casual genre. Right, um, right. But if we keep going, I mean, I have, I have a clear vision. I mean, there's no doubt to anybody listening, there's a market for the entire vegan movement, whether it's clothes, whether it's um, you know, vending stores or uh, home products, and whether it's food in a grocery store, food in a restaurant. The, you know, the movement, the interest, health, environment, animal rights is real. It's growing. It's getting attention every day. And it's really moving fast. So it's a great sector to get in, particularly if you're passionate about it and have experience in it. Yeah. Um, you know, so we, if we keep moving ahead, I will start seeking out a partner uh, that shares that passion and wants to take us from two to 20 or two to Got 30. Got it. Got it. No, yeah, for sure. So how did you know, you mentioned the, the new eatery. So you only opened the first one in 2015. So essentially, as far as restaurants go, that's still fairly new. How did you know that you were ready to open a second eatery? And how far away is it from the original one physically? Yeah, so it, it um, always was obvious. Well, let me just a 125 seat, 4,000 square foot restaurant with 40 employees. I didn't want to do a chain of those. And I, you know, that, that takes enormous capital too. And frankly, I'm not sure most cities need more than one or two premier vegan restaurants. I mean, Philadelphia has veg and maybe New York city has candles. Can, yeah. You can yeah. argue there's more than one and there are and Los Angeles has, you know, crossroads and pure food and wine, plant food, and wine, but, uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, you don't need 10 upscale vegan restaurants at the present time. So if we were going to, you know, expand, it was going to be small, fast, casual, and um, grab and go. And maybe we were not quite ready, but frankly, it was location, 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 only about five miles away, on about the busiest traveled street in the city uh, or suburbs of Detroit uh, called Woodward Avenue. Um, there was a restaurant that a sign went up for lease, and it was on the main road. It had amazing windows. It had great signage. One day I stopped and looked in the windows and I could see, whoa, there's actually a lot of restaurant equipment because so typically when a restaurant closes, which happens very often, you know, due to financial stress, everybody guts all the equipment and they probably put it on auction, raise some more dollars to pay off debt. There was a lot of equipment there. It looked pretty new. And I ended up, you know, with really irresponsible nature, called the agent and was told, you know, it's already leased. You're, you know, a couple of days late. Sorry. Okay, so that was end of story. About five months later, the sign went back up, and uh, oh. I called. It was just a street. I travel a lot, and I called, and she goes, no, the deal never happened. Let's take a look, and I brought my team, and, you know, I was the one pushing. It was the perfect location with 100,000 cars going by. It had a lot of existing, only a year to two-year-old restaurant equipment. It had more than 20 parking spaces, which for any restaurant is key, and for a yeah. fast casual to park go in, grab a meal, get a car and go out. I mean, obviously McDonald's, Burger King and Wendy's, if they didn't have convenient parking, the whole concept wouldn't work. And sure. for us, it had to be too. And we just looked each other in the eyeballs and negotiated a deal that got more and more favorable and um, said, you know, we can do this. We got a great team. We got great, you know, momentum. And God, the public has been so wonderful about uh, realizing how different these two spaces are, even though they're five miles apart. You know, one's for celebration and one's for the stress of trying to get to the soccer game with kids. Yeah. Not yeah. feeding them hamburgers and fries. So, Brilliant. Uh, you know, and it's good that we're only five miles apart. It would never work if it was the same concept, but we're literally back and forth many nights and, uh, you know, it's a short little drive. Yeah. So I was going to touch on that in terms of, because we mentioned earlier, you know, you're, you've got a speaking career, writing, your longevity center, and now you own these two restaurants. So how do you manage all of that? And how much are you present and working at the restaurants? Yeah. So, you know, all that has evolved in the almost two and a half years that we've been open at the main place, Green Space Cafe. Um, I still have a very active cardiology practice, but for a variety of reasons, I changed my practice essentially the same day the first green space opened. 
and went from a quarter of a century of running the hospitals at 5.30 in the morning and running for emergencies at three in the morning for cardiac catheterizations and heart attacks to I had already morphed into a pretty advanced preventive cardiologist. You know, I'd spent a quarter century treating your heart attack. Let me spend the next 15 years so you never have one and shifting the focus. Bottom line is I created some time. I created a life where I didn't have to go to the hospital at five in the morning and I didn't have to go in the hospital on the weekends. I was in a good position to do that. That's a whole nother entrepreneurial story that isn't necessarily a vegan. Well, I have a vegan cardiology practice, but um, I needed to create the time and I had to do it without too much financial risk because I needed to continue to have a stable income. Plus, I love what I do. I absolutely love uh, taking care of people, figuring them out, putting them back together and turning them into plant-based machines that reverse their heart disease (laughs) if they have any. So I did. I did make a transformation. And uh, it wasn't a retirement by any means. It was a bit of a contraction and a focus. Um, So typically, I'm up 6.30. And I actually put a premium on sleep, which Ariana Huffington probably gets the most. Yes, yes. I read her book on that. (laughs) I do. I used to be uh, an abuser of my uh, sleep time. Now I'm a... I I praise and hallow sleep time. But, you know, I'm up by 6, 6 I'm you know, doing a short but very wonderful workout I'm, uh, over in my medical office from about 8 to about 5 p.m. And then typically if I don't have an evening charity event or board meeting because I'm on a lot of stuff in town, I'll be at one of the restaurants. And it'll be social. In my part, it'll be social. It'll be greeting. It'll be going table to table. Everything okay? How are you? Have you been here before? Mm-hmm. You know, probably half the people there know who I am. I do a lot of TV, media, social media. Um, and some don't, and I'll just introduce myself. Now, literally on Friday and Saturday night, um, particularly when we just had the one main large restaurant, my wife and I, and she's Karen, is equally as passionate. It's my son's business, essentially, but we like what we do. And frankly, I have uh, a great amount of humility. We bus tables, I carry trays, she delivers drinks. You know, we're the people, if there's a problem with the meal or you know, we have to comp a meal or there's a food allergy. You know, we're the ones on the front line and um, you know, yeah. we're really we're really curating this thing for customer excellence and customer appreciation. Yeah. Which every yeah. business has to focus on and nobody loves and cares as much as the core group that's really, you know, for sure. Know. And it sounds like you've got a good team around you, which I think you mentioned. Right. So yeah. yeah. So in terms of the the customers then, um Joel, so I'm curious. So you're in Detroit and I don't know Detroit very well, I must admit. I, I don't know. So are you what kind of area I'm curious about your customers, so the kind of demographics. So for example, the land of Cush in Baltimore, Maryland, is based in a kind of urban, uh, you know, inner city environment, you know, low low and it's bringing plant based eating to sort of lower socioeconomic communities. How is your um uh restaurants how are they positioned like who are your core demographics are they mainly vegans and plant-based yeah. people or or non yeah that was one of the magics of that phone call that monday after we broke off negotiations on sunday is that location um, was the equivalent of soho in new york or west hollywood in la it was the artsy um uh rainbow, um, really loving and accepting suburb of Detroit. Literally, it's in, it uh, abuts the city of Detroit, and uh, it's the closest suburb to Detroit. But, you know, just a really eclectic group of music and restaurants and bars and arts and such. And um, so, it's, you know, so we put up a restaurant. A lot of people thought actually it was a marijuana dispensary. It said green space. It was under construction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was kind of the right neighborhood with a doctor involved to have a dispensary for uh, <laughs> cannabis and um, and all that. But um, so, you know, there's an enormous amount of growth and vibrancy in Detroit pop, proper, downtown Detroit. It's going through a renewal that you read about in the New York Times that's authentic and multi-billion dollar investments and all. Uh, we'll get there. I want to be in Detroit. It's my hometown and it's amazing. But right now we're in a suburban eclectic setting and where we move for a second space is basically just a high traffic, important conduit with a, a lot of residential homes very close, people that need to eat meals and need to you know grab and go. Now we can't serve 
every community right now. People do come to us from all over southeastern Michigan, probably about a 90-mile radius is pretty typical on any Friday or Saturday night. But the core group is, you know, it's not really a walking group. I think the core group is about a 10-mile radius, very dense demographic, uh, not much industry around. Predominantly vegans or vegetarians? Well, or oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So, I mean, our, our most faithful core group are certainly vegans, sure. But, um, you know, and I think what the, we don't use the word. We can argue this to the end of the day. Do you use the word vegan to market aggressively? Do you use the word <laughs> less aggressively? Because despite great pride, there's a couple issues with the word vegan. One, some people interpret vegan. Vegan is the food, the clothing, the lining you have on your car seat, whether those things are animal-based or not. Um, vegan uh, equates to animal rights being maybe your main motive, which is I honor every step of that. Whereas I come from a medical background, got me into this 41 years ago, and I now completely honor and endorse the environmental animal rights aspect. But, you know, I like the word plant diet. And I just was on TV today and they said, so what's special about your new place, green space ago? I said, we take amazing plants and we take plants and colorful plants and beautiful plants and healthy plants and plants, plants, plants. Um, you know, so usually we'll have a restaurant, very often 70% women having girls night out and celebrations and birthdays. And it's interesting because about a week later, I can just see them roping their man in. You know, if it's, a, you know, <laughs> and dragging him in, look at, I know there's no beef here, but they got burgers and they got flatbreads and they got bowls and they got burritos and, you know, you're going to be okay. You're not going to die tonight that you're not going <laughs> to a burger. And uh, one of the coolest things, there's a uh, Asian fruit, maybe you've talked about called jackfruit. Yeah, and yeah. You can turn jackfruit into absolutely something that looks like barbecued meat, even though it's really a very healthy whole food, you know, and it's not processed, it's not factory derived. And jackfruit has been an eye opener. You know, you give me a real burly, tough guy who comes in with a sour puss face, and we give him a you know a barbecued jackfruit burger with purple purple coleslaw and uh, and a uh, beer. And my God, their eyes say this is damn good. It is damn good, and it it's healthy. And so we win them over. For sure. Brilliant. So you've talked a little bit about the marketing and you've answered one of the questions was, yeah, about the use of the word vegan or plant-based. So what have been some of your sort of key marketing strategies? Because like you mentioned, you know, there's a, a rise now in plant-based or vegan restaurants. So how do you go about, I'm going to ask you, I guess, a double question. How do you go about standing out um, from other plant-based restaurants and what kind of marketing strategies have been successful for you? Yeah, absolutely. So I think like every business nowadays, number one, I had a bit of a platform before we opened as a cardiologist, as a plant cardiologist, as a integrative cardiologist. Uh, I had learned in the last five years, Twitter, Instagram, and then been doing Facebook a little longer. Um, and I continued to grow that and speak. And uh, I just had an opportunity to present this restaurant to a lot of people locally and nationally. But then way before we opened, we had Instagram accounts and we had Twitter accounts and Facebook pages and I would you know kind of integrate my following with those pages so people would follow and this and that so I think we had five six thousand seven thousand Facebook followers before we opened oh that's um, interesting that's and, a smart know, strategy yeah mm. but uh, you know, way ahead of time we put up you know some health information some recipes some pictures of some you know food we were playing with some of the construction and you know People were anticipating it. People were looking forward to it. That was part of it. I mean, um, it's worth getting a good public relations person if you can afford it, even if it's just for the opening, because being on TV and having that video to use evergreen um, is just priceless. You know, to go into a video studio and shoot a five minute professional video might cost you you know, several thousand dollars to get on a meatless Monday morning TV show locally, um, you know, or during heart month during February, something that might interest them to pitch them uh, is absolutely, you know, priceless and costs nothing more than the time and the food prep you do. I was again making smoothies on TV this morning and, you know, it really matters. Um, you know, going local fairs, we, we don't miss many of the local plant fairs, some of the other bigger health fairs 
have a table, maybe it's just brochures, cards, t-shirts, maybe we have samples, maybe we're selling jackfruit sliders or uh, vegan mac and cheese or something. Um, cool. uh, and then the, the good old word of mouth. There's nothing yeah, wrong yeah. That, that customer leaving happy, leaving satisfied. If they're not leaving satisfied, they got a gift card. So they, you know, with an apology. Oh, that's a good strategy. Back, that's cool. Uh, yeah. You, know, yeah. you want them back. And, um, you know, you're never going to please everybody, but we really do work hard at that. I mean, we had this brand new restaurant we opened last week was insanely busy. And it was a bit bumpy because it was, the volume was crazy. It's everything you want and everything you don't want. <laughs> and we were pretty liberal in comping and gift cards. You know, people understand it's your first week. And then this week we had, the worst ice storm in April in Michigan in a long time, maybe ever. And we were out of power for two days. And again, we, oh, have no. in, we have to keep in contact with the customer base. Yes, we're closed. We're open. So very, very active social media. I spend some time on it. Uh, we have uh, a, you know, a social media person that spends some time on it so we can keep in constant communication with our, our peeps. Yeah. But we're, you know, we're, we're always evolving Instagram video, for pretty much everybody has become fun, informative, you know, a way to stay in touch, entertain. It really is entertainment. And uh, we do a lot of Instagram video with a lot of creativity there. Nice, nice. And I like that you're involved in that as well, which I think is is interesting, as well as obviously, you know, you've got your, your team around you, you're sort of capitalizing, like you said, on your your profile. Um, and I think that's really good to point out as well is, you know, developing your, your public profile as an expert um, can really help if you then do say, do what you did and branch out into, I guess, another form of, of business um, within the health sphere or, or any other sphere, um, which is um, fantastic. So can you tell me, Gerald, we'll just sort of we'll get, get to wrapping up now. What, what would you say have been some of the key lessons you've learned from running these restaurants that perhaps you didn't learn necessarily from running your cardiology or your other um, things that you do? And what, 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 yeah. Kind of, yeah, you know, what have been the key learning points? It's always going to be humble, um, stay open-minded. I mean, we really, really, really listen to our customers. Um, that is one of the beauties of social media. You can actually, and that's where Instagram video particularly, we can put picture of a new dish and we can take a poll. I mean, you can actually say, <laughs> would you like to see this on the menu? Yes, no. And you get hundreds of responses. It's a very effective, instant way. So listening to customers, listening to feedback, quickly making changes, letting the customer maybe know how quickly we made changes. Maybe it's portion size. Maybe it's quinoa instead of brown rice. Uh, maybe it's brighter, you know, brighter colors, more organic or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's some of that in medical practice, but nowhere near as much attention. I mean, the doctors at the top of the heap, patients, you know, really are the ones at the top of the heap. But they don't <laughs> often feel that way and they aren't often treated that way or not enough. So, um, you know, humility, listening, responding, communicating. Um, is more important in this business because you know, there's just tremendous competition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what's your final question then? What's your long-term vision for, for Green Space and for yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, I have taught for so long that, you know, when the right thing to do becomes the easy thing to do will make a major health difference, uh, you know, in, in this city, this country, and around the world. And it is still pretty much everywhere uh, tough to do the right thing when it comes to healthy food on the go and such. So I think there's a very, very bright future. Um, and I would, I, we do actually now have a business plan, uh, you know, of opening two to three a year uh, once we get this model just a little bit more refined, oh, maybe cool. taking on a partner. But I think within got, within your area, Joel, or are you talking over, nationally? All over. We actually oh. already have a outlet in Texas. Oh, uh, nice. We have a food truck in Austin, Texas, that'll open on May first. Oh, Very wonderful! That oh. the weather the weather favors the food truck business a bit better in the South, and uh, <laughs> we would be slammed if we were in the food truck business right now in Detroit, given the weather. So. Um, at any rate, so we're already expanding into another state. But no, absolutely, a doctor-driven, food is information, food is medicine. Yes, we're not a clinic, 
but you're going to walk out of here healthier than when you walked in um, and it's fast and it's as affordable as super healthy food that's largely organic can be because mm. that is a challenge. There are uh, no food subsidies for broccoli like there are for cheese and meat. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, knowing all that, I think the future is very, very bright. And, uh, yeah, there'll be a lot of them. Wonderful. I think it's wonderful. It's fantastic that, like you say, it's a doctor driven. I mean, that, that uh, restaurant, which I think really gives it an edge because, uh, you know, people do, like you say, people tend to, you know, take notice of what medical doctors say. And I'm loving this big kind of rise in plant based doctors kind of not only walking their talk, but actually providing solutions. So instead of writing a prescription for pills or whatever, you're able to say, well, come to the restaurant and, and eat. So um, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And you've shared some really wonderful insights some really good lessons for for entrepreneurs so thank you so much been a pleasure speaking with you joe thank you for joining me today you bet. thank you so much so that was dr joel khan from green space cafe and green space and go you can find out more at drjoelkhan.com and that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 101 now for our vegan business news roundup. Sales of Don Lee Farms organic plant-based burger topped 1 million in less than 60 days, according to the company. The California-based firm is a national supplier of vegetarian and meat-based foods, with its products available at Costco, Walmart and Whole Foods. President Donald Goodman said, Interest in our organic plant-based burger has just exploded. We're just keeping up with demand and are implementing plans to expand distribution every week. The burger bleeds organic beet juice and sizzles on the grill like raw beef through the use of organic vegetable-based fats. And the company says it's the only burger in the category to qualify for the organic seal certified by the United States Department of Agriculture. So although this company isn't a vegan one, I think it's great that its vegan product is seeing such strong sales, because if that keeps up, it could result in companies like this ditching their animal-based products and focusing solely on plant-based ones, as Elmhurst Dairy did. What with the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat leading the way in terms of high-profile media coverage, this category looks to be one set for growth as more companies enter the market. A German shoe company has created a footwear line made from mushroom leather. Nat 2's vegan sneaker line is made from real fungus. The material and concept were created by Berlin-based designer Nina Fabert of Zinder. The mushroom leather is created from tree fungus that's harvested over a period of a year, and the shoes are made by hand in a small family manufacturer in Italy. Other materials used in the shoe line include eco-cotton frotte, microfiber suede from recycled PET bottles, real cork insoles and real rubber outsoles. According to Nat2, the look of the sneakers is vintage and they feel soft to the touch. The material is organic, vegan, gluten and chemical free and the fungus is both antiseptic and antibacterial. Wow. (laughs) So yet more innovative developments in the shoe and material space. At the moment, the process to create the mushroom leather is expensive. So the sneaker line is at the high end of the market. But hopefully as production methods scale and these materials become more mainstream, they'll start to flow down to mass markets. Finally, a vegan pet food company in the UK has won the Queen's Award for Enterprise for International Trade as a result of the company's growth, particularly in export sales, reports Plant-Based News. Benevo Vegan Pet Foods, which was launched in 2005, sells vegan dog and cat food. Although the company is based in the UK, its international sales started to race ahead of those of the UK, with customers hailing from California, Japan, Norway, New Zealand, South Africa, Hong Kong and Israel, among others. 
Company director Daryl DeVries said the award is a sign of the growth of veganism in the UK and worldwide. As veganism becomes more mainstream, people are starting to look for alternatives in all areas of their lives, including the options available for their companion animals, he said. How fantastic that a vegan company received such a prestigious award, and it's great to see this market taking off in an even bigger way. As I wrote in my Forbes column recently about the launch of Ryan Bethencourt's Wild Earth Vegan Dog Food, this is a category ripe for development. Exciting times. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more free resources as well as details of how we can work together to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. And I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now. 